Uh, Matteo, can you see the full screen on? Okay. Yes, good. Okay, so we just have to click twice on uh, on the keyboard of my computer on the left and one on the right. Right, so uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Filippo and, and, and Matteo to organize uh, this uh, very important uh, series of seminars. I'm going to put my, you know, uh, timer to check how many minutes I, I talk. Now, um, uh, I, I'd like today to introduce a paper that I've been uh, working on together with two colleagues, Ben Tarnet Dickstrom and Mark Fettes, and uh, it is entitled Towards an Index of Linguistic Justice. I insist on the first word, towards, because this is an attempt to uh, develop something and, uh, and, and even more importantly, perhaps to um, uh, raise, uh, well, to stimulate a debate. And um, uh, as, as, as Filippo said, I'm, I'm based in Belfast at the moment. I'm visiting researcher here in Barcelona, uh, formally to study the Catalan language policy in practice because uh, I was tired of rain and, uh, and, and, uh, and wind in Northern Ireland. And I'm sorry for guys you were in Ireland, in Limerick, but no, I'm just joking. Anyway, so today's presentation uh, is going to be organized as follows. Uh, we'll first try to you know, discuss this question. So why do we need an index uh, of linguistic justice? And then I will move towards the core of the presentation. So to understand the connections between language policy on the one hand and the action of the state, the government, uh, before introducing in more detail the approach that is behind this attempt. So the index, I will tell you, is made of 10 indicators that can be aggregated in a very simple way. But the focus here of this presentation is not uh, the indicators as such, but more the, the, the approach that we develop to, uh, to get to these indicators. And, and this presentation is going to be a bit technical, so because I really would like to get feedback from, from the audience, okay? So it's not an introduction, it's something that is going to be uh, a bit more technical. So please, you know, um, uh, have patience, it takes time to get to get there. Now, uh, let's start with something, you know, uh, important. So uh, why an index of linguistic justice? Do we need this? Is it necessary? What for? Well, you know, um, the uh, indices or indexes are uh, used regularly in national international comparative analysis uh, to compare different things, to create uh, rankings or just to monitor the evolution of, uh, of a variable. And governments, they, uh, they use uh, indicators that are then aggregated into indexes um, to collect organized information, quantified information on some important aspects of economics and social life, and to monitor the evolution over time to assess, for example, whether policies, public policies are effective in uh, stimulating in, 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 in bringing about change. And there are some very important indexes that we all know, like the Human Development Index uh, published by United Nations uh, and the Gini Index for, in, uh, for Income Inequality, which is used by the World Bank, among others. And then there are also you know, many indices, maybe there is even too many actually of them, published by magazines, foundations, universities, or NGOs like um, the WordPress Freedom Index, the Global Competitive in Democracy, in the Gender Equality Index, and so on and so forth. But nothing exists in the, like this exists in the Arab language. There are some governments, and here in Catalonia, uh, we have an excellent example of that. Governments collect the indicators, especially to monitor sociolinguistic uh, phenomena, uh, typically the uh, vitality of minority languages. And in Catalonia, as I say, there is a very important and, and, uh, and, and rich system called SIL, uh, System of uh, uh, Sistema de Indicatore Linguisticos. Please correct me my horrible Catalan pronunciation, uh, Joseph. Uh, but uh, these are indicators that monitor specific uh, variables. Indices or indexes are aggregated indicators to monitor complex variables. 
And, and the fact that we don't have uh, indexes to monitor language policy and linguistic justice in particular, since this is a symposium about linguistic justice, um, is, is surprising, uh, considering that uh, language is something, um, considering the ubiquity and the importance of that language in any aspect of, of human life, as, as we all know. I, I don't know um, the, the, the audience, where do you come from, guys? Uh, probably some of you are philosophers, some are applied linguists, so uh, I'm, I, I'm talking here in a broad sense. Um, and, and perhaps this negligence, at least from, from the point of view of policymakers, is that many consider languages as just a tool to communicate between individuals and something that is beyond and should be beyond perhaps uh, decision-making powers of governments. But this is, as we all know, I assume, at least us, you know, uh, people making research in language policy, this is a wrong view because it overlooks the fact that languages and communication occurring between uh, people in one or more language are uh, deeply embedded in uh, social, political, economic relationships. And well, the government and the state apparatus is part of this web of relationships. And these presentations start from this simple observation. Now, the role of the government in being part of the linguistic environment and in shaping the linguistic environment. I want here to recall very simple notions that for many of you are clearly already well known, but maybe for others, especially from political philosophy, they are less known. So I'll just briefly recall what do we mean by language policy? Um, well, language policy, well, there are many definitions, but according to you know, this short definition quoted from, from, from a book by the, the, uh, Johnson, he defined language policy as a policy mechanism that impacts the structure, the function, the use, or the acquisition of languages. And traditionally, you know, in the literature, there are, we make a distinction between uh, corpus planning, uh, status planning, and acquisition planning. Although some people see acquisition planning as part of status planning. And I just want to recall these concepts for those of you who are not familiar with this. So corpus planning, which is not going to be the topic today of my talk, involves the series of choices about issues like the choice of a variety of a language, uh, the alphabet, you know, some languages change the alphabet, for example, Turkish was written in Iran. Spelling, the lexicon, minority language, people and linguists and internally and, and people involved in internal linguistics. Um, acquisition planning, as the word says, concerns language policy in the area of language acquisition, and it's ultimately it, it is aimed at increasing the number of users of a language. Uh, the typical example is language education, i.g., teaching foreign languages in schools or uh, promoting bilingual education by immersion program programs also known as CLIL, and of course, uh, providing training for adults. And these, these, these are components of language planning and language policy. I use here the terms uh, together. But the core of language policy essentially is the, the status. Um, in a very narrow way, you can consider this word status planning as giving a formal status to a language or not here in Catalonia. Catalan is official, at least in, in, this, in this region. Uh, it can be used for administrative purposes, uh, together with, with, with Castilian, with Spanish. But in practice, and this is what is more important for us today, to us today, is status planning, I'm talking here about public policies in the area of languages, consists in the allocation of functions uh, of languages in different domains. So status planning in practice, in substance, means to allocate functions. Oh, I'm sorry. I, you see, I forgot to move. I'm very sorry. You should, you should tell me this. Sorry that you have not lost anything. But this is the important slide. So I'm here now. Um, sorry, guys. I have to click into different computers. So in practice, 
as I said, uh, 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 status planning from the point of view of government consists in allocating functions to a language or more than one language in the following domains. Law and order, so which languages should, should be used by the police, in prisons, in the army, public administration, and this is very important. So what are the languages that can be used legitimately in official documents, in your tax return, and uh, in any regulations and, uh, and uh, uh, administrative documents. Languages to be used in civil and criminal justice. What languages can be used in tribunals, in courts? Uh, making decisions about which languages can be used in, 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 in these domains is language policy, in particular status plan. Very important, names of places, road signs. In some areas where I come from, for example, Northern Ireland, this is a highly contested issue. Uh, uh, street signs can be in, are in English, of course, uh, should be also in Irish to some extent, but very often, especially in certain areas, as soon as Irish appears, then the, it is cancelled or street signs are destroyed. What is interesting, why they are in red? Because these domains are exclusive competence of the government. There's no such a thing as a private tribunal. Private uh, people cannot put road signs. Yes, they can put the name of places in the restaurant, in their business, but you know, signs on the street indicating where is the airport, etc. This is something that only the government can do. And of course, public administration by definition is uh, organized by the government, either at the national level or at the regional level or local level. This is not the point. I'm talking about government in general. I'm not talking about the executive. I'm not talking about the government of the day at the national level. I'm talking about government as a system of public forces, public authorities organized at the central, local, regional level. But the government is also very active in other domains, including essential public services, education, healthcare, social care, for example, unemployment benefits, uh, support for invalid people, together with the private sector. In, in most countries where uh, a well-developed welfare state is implemented, these tasks are mostly governmental tasks, but there may be private schools, private clinics, etc. And there are also other domains that can be the object of status planning, including the media and economic activities. But, but in this case, the power of the government is smaller because it's shared to a large extent with the private sector. So status planning in, in practice means to influence the use and the allocation of function of one or more languages in all these domains. And you already see from this slide, what is the tricky issue? Well, many of these domains are either exclusive competence of the government or the government has a predominant role in these domains, especially in social services. And this brings us to the next slide where, uh, where we ask the question, well, basically, if this is the case, so if the government has all these competences in many domains that can be the object of status planning, then language policies cannot be avoided. This is the first thing. And the next slide I will show they should not be avoided either. And I like to quote here, uh, I quote very often this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, paragraph from, from a paper by Heller the Scooter, I don't know whether Heller is here, uh, who uh, discussing you know, uh, uh, a book by Kimlika, he writes, uh, in making policies on, among other things, education or simply court wrong practices, tribunals, courts, etc., the states unavoidably will have to make linguistic decisions. A fully alinguistic state policy simply don't exist. So the correct opposition is therefore not one between linguistic laissez-faire, linguistic freedom, and linguistic regulation or language policy, but just before different forms of linguistic regulations. In other words, there is no zero option in the field of language policy. We cannot not intervene. But if there is no zero option in language policy, if we cannot intervene, and if we can just decide different forms of linguistic regulation, well, the question is then, what are the effects of these choices? And this is where indicators and measurements 
of uh, uh, linguistic justice are relevant. Because if the government cannot abstain from intervening, then it's interesting to see what are the results of government's decisions as regards languages on a given territory. And this is why there's the justification of using indexes to monitor the effects of uh, and the consequences of language policy. But apart from the fact that language policies that we just said cannot be avoided, there is another question, and this is more related to um, the study of language policy from an economic perspective. Language policy sometimes should not be avoided. And here it's a bit more complicated, but you know, in uh, uh, in 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 in, public, in in welfare economics, one of the central questions that has that have been addressed is whether the market, the free market, is an efficient system of allocation of resources. And the answer is yes, but uh, only under certain assumptions. I don't have the time to go into details, but there are goods, there are cases in which the market, so the, the spontaneous interaction between individuals and businesses does not lead to an efficient allocation of resources. And these are called as market failures. Now, in economic theory, there is a difference between different types of goods. And goods are classified according to two variables, whether they are rival or not in consumption, and whether they are excludable or not excludable. I don't have the time to go into detail, but I would just want to give you two very simple examples. So an apple is a very clear example of private good. It is a rival because if I eat an apple, you cannot eat the same apple, I'm sorry. Uh, a car is also a rival. If I buy one Mercedes, you cannot buy the same one. And if I use it, you cannot use the same. You cannot drive it at the same time. And it is excludable because you can prevent someone from uh, using the good. Uh, if I just lock my car, then I'm sorry, you cannot use it. So it is a rival and it is excludable. And these are private goods. And in general, economic theory showed that under certain assumptions, private goods are efficiently provided by the free market. But there are other goods that the market cannot provide efficiently. And goods like, for example, defense or public lighting or name of places, they are not efficiently provided by the market because they are non-arrival and are not excludable. And I just want to give you an example. Take, for example, public lighting. So when you walk in the evening in the streets of Barcelona and these streets are lighted because there is public light, there's no way this good providing light in the middle of the night is rival. I can walk and you can walk and 10 people, 100 people can walk and light is provided for everyone. You cannot, this, there's no rivalry in that consumption. We all benefit from that good. Uh, if you go, if you drive to the airport and you see road signs, everyone can see them. And the fact that I see that good, I see this information does not prevent you from doing that. So this is no rival. And it is not excludable because if you, if you walk in the street of Barcelona in the night and the street is light, lighted, then basically, you know, there's no way I can exclude you from using that if the good is already there. Can you imagine if you have to put five cents every 10 meters to light the bar, the various lights, that would be completely ineffective. So there are goods that are provided by the government because they are non-rival and non-excludable. There are also goods that are, I will, I will come this to this later. And these are called as market failures because the market fail to provide an efficient allocation of resources. Well, some goods, some public goods, they are uh, linguistically related. Name of places is an example. Languages used on banknotes is another example. Just as publishing documents on the internet, unless we use um, a password to the access, but once a, a website is published or um, a, a, a radio uh, program is broadcasted, unless we have passwords and system to crypt that, but everyone can have access to this. You just need a radio or you just need uh, to have a connection to the internet and you can see documents published online in many languages or just in one. And this is non-rival because I can read the document online. You can read the document online. Even this lecture is non-rival 
because basically everyone can have access to this unless there are limits by Zoom. And it is not excludable because once you know you 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 you, you a, a transmission a program is on the air, well that's 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 free to everyone who can have a who have a radio. On top of this, there are some some in modern welfare state there are some public goods that are provided by the government for fairness reasons. For example, healthcare and education. Children they cannot make informed choices. And it will be very often unacceptable that children don't receive education because parents don't have the means. Healthcare is another very important area in which you can have technically private hospitals, but since your health depends on the health of other people, and probably the vaccines against coronavirus are the best example, there are spillovers effects. And for this reason, these services are provided by the public because of spillover effects. So, what are the consequences of that? As I said before, language policies in many areas cannot be avoided, and in some cases they should not be avoided. And this, you know, brings about, so what are the responsibilities of the government vis-a-vis -vis the people? So many publicly provided goods have a linguistic component, and the government must make linguistic decisions about that, either explicitly or implicitly. And, and since it is a very difficult, uh, from a practical point of view, to have a situation of absolute linguistic equality, well, language policies and status planning in particular, they have distributed consequences on the people. Oops, I always have to forget to use two. Uh, so the idea behind, you know, the, uh, the the index of linguistic justice is to mod, to measure these distributive effects. So linguistic policies, language policies, cannot be avoided, should not be avoided, uh, at least to some extent. Then they must, however, be controlled. We must have as people. Uh, uh, an idea of what are the consequences of governmental actions in this area. And using indicators and aggregating them into an index can help to address this question. What are the distributive effects of language policies using one or two languages or three, or using languages to different extents? What are the impacts of these choices on the well being of individuals? and on uh, the, the situation, the economic and social and political situation of people living in a country. And this is the rationale for, for developing uh, an index. Well, this paper was written, you know, in a very um, applied, uh, uh, in, in, in a perspective that we can call, you know, um, uh, applied research. Um, my co-authors and I, we, uh, we are interested in the effects of, of public policies and we are very much interested in applied research. That's why I use here the term applied linguistic justice. And here I want to connect a bit with the current ongoing debate in linguistic justice. Um, oh, in the current debate, most authors focus on what has been described as the fair back, uh, background condition or position that is linguistic justice should equate to establishing fair background, back, background conditions for individuals. And in this prevalent approach, based on Rawls theory of justice, tend to focus on the access to certain basic linguistic resources in the form of rights, goods, or services. Uh, so this is no, and I quote here people who are present today, so please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm quoting here a paper where, excellent paper, uh, where people make reviews and, and overviews of the different approaches. And, and that's, that's certainly uh, one, one very important perspective. So to what extent people have access, have fair access to rights, goods, and services. Another approach um, that was developed recently uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm referring here to, you know, just published papers. There are some PhD theses going on on this topic um, uh, at the Aston University. So but a new approach uh, to the study of linguistic justice um, uh, has been proposed in which um, uh, 
linguistic inequalities and 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 and, uh, and, uh, and disadvantage are defined in terms of what people are able to be and to do in a given language, uh, making a distinct, the usual distinction between functioning and capabilities uh, of the uh, which is which has been uh, developed. I mean, this approach has been developed, as we know, by by Sen and Nussbaum. Uh, rather than in terms of what they receive. So the question here is to examine the distributive consequences, not in terms of resources available, as in a royal perspective, but rather in a capability approach, what people are able to do and to be in a given language. And there are some papers that have been published so far, you can see them here quoted. But, you know, in applied research, the differences between to these two approaches should not be exaggerated. The fact that someone has access to documents, administrative documents, can be seen both as a resource or even a right, but it can be seen as something that enable you to do some things. Uh, for example, opening a business or making your tax return. So in practice, what matters is that uh, either if you see um, uh, uh, publicly provided linguistic goods as a resource or something that enables you to be and to do what you wish, then the matter is whether these goods are available or not. So Andrew uh, Shorten, in one of his very good papers as usual, argues that both approaches have limited practical applicability. And, and certainly he is right, because people may disagree about what good or services uh, people are entitled to have and about what persons should be able to be and to do. And we all agree about that. However, and this is the key point, as we just seen in the previous part of the, the presentation, well, we can agree that people have different opinions, but there are some language related goods that necessarily are provided by the government for efficiency or fairness reasons, public goods and goods that are exclusive, goods whose production is exclusive competence of the governments, like courts and public administration, that are relevant for all citizens, long-term residents, asylum seekers in a given country or jurisdiction. So if we downsize a bit the scope, if we focus on one specific aspect of language policy, namely what the government does, then we will discover that there are some, that, that status planning is unavoidable, sometimes even necessary, and, and that concerns everyone because the private sector does not produce some goods or it's not predominantly, or some goods are, or some linguistic related goods are not predominantly produced by the market. So we start from this. We, I mean, me and my co-authors, we focus on the action of the government precisely because this is not avoidable. And in the paper, we, 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 we set these priorities, these domains of action, law and order. So studying linguistic justice in the courts, tribunals, public security systems, police and prisons, public administration. Again, this is an area of exclusive competence of the government. So the general registry, the tax office, migration office, what languages are used in these domains? And some essential public services, especially healthcare and hospital clinics, emergency centers, especially for asylum seekers and refugees. So we focus on these domains uh, of areas of status planning, because as I say, the, the, the competence of the government is exclusive or predominant because linguistically, related public goods or publicly provided goods in these areas uh, are the responsibility of the government for efficiency reasons and for the simple uh, uh, functioning, uh, operational functioning of governmental uh, bodies and agencies. Education raises complex issues, acquisition planning in particular, because it can alter the linguistic repertoire of people, and this is going to be addressed in future work. I'm going to come back to this in the conclusions, Filippo, if we have time. Now, the second step 
uh, of this, uh, say this, this is a rather complex presentation that really I would like to have feedback from you. So we have defined the, the domains, the areas, the relevant domains and areas of our index of linguistic justice. Now we have to consider that the, the analytical dimension that we want to consider. Okay, and this is perhaps the most philosophical part of the paper. Well, Alan Pater, building on Kloss work in one of his papers, identifies three general classes of linguistic rights. He defines these as the following. Toleration rights that guarantee members of a society freedom of expression in the language of their choice. Norm and accommodation rights According to Pattern, these are rights that aims at facilitating communication in the local dominant language in certain public contexts for those who are not fluent in it. Typically, you know, this involves the use of interpreters, translators for tourists, foreigners who don't, are not proficient in the local dominant language. And uh, this is what uh, Alan Pattern calls the normal language of public communication. This is his expression, his normal language. Of course, only one in his view, at least. And then there are a third class of rights that are not contingent on a lack of proficiency in the normal language of public communication in patterns words. And the person is free to exercise the promotion rights in a minority language, even if she's fluent in the majority language. So promotion rights means basically that you should provide goods and services uh, also in, in, a, in a minority language even if speakers of such minority language are fluent in or near fluent in the dominant language. This is Pattern's view. Well, we adapt a bit and we focus this distinction and we adapt this to our purposes. Well, the, the, the assumption made by Pattern that there is one single normal language of public communication is problematic. And it is problematic because it's naturalized among a legal view of the state as a benchmark. Well, the choice of a normal language of public communication is not a neutral act. As May, Stephen May says, the imposition of a single language for the use in state activities and services is by no means a neutral act. In many countries, the, the normal language of public communications in pattern terms is the language of the majority. But there are many countries in the world, especially in Africa, in where you know the, the, the dominant language used by the government in administration are former colonial languages like English or French or Portuguese that are not understood by the vast majority of the population. Just as uh, English in the European Union is the most commonly used administrative language of the European Commission and European Central Bank, but this is a language in which only 13% of European citizens are either native speakers or proficient. So many, many contexts, the normal public language is not the language of the majority, actually. Uh, it's a language that many, many times people don't understand. So in the paper, we name the language or the languages used in the public provision of language related goods by the government as the original language choice or fundamental language policy. And this is a not, not a neutral act. This is a policy choice. And by itself, ipso facto, decided one or more languages of a normal public communication is a policy choice that creates an original distribution of resources in society. A distribution of resources, because people who are not fluent in the language used for administration or people who don't have this language as mother tongue, then they, are, they, they find themselves in a, a disadvantaged position. So potential inequalities, we all know is that it's very difficult to guarantee all services in all possible languages. But the key idea here is that the original language choice creates an original distribution of resources that could be and perhaps should be compensated in some way or in another. 
So the, the potential inequalities generated by the original language choice could be compensated in, in a, one language or in one way or in another. Um, and this compensation is something available for speakers of other languages who have to bear the costs to adapt to the fundamental language quality via language learning, bearing translation costs, or sometimes just bowing. So using the majority language uh, instead of their minority language, thereby having to bear a symbolic cost. And focusing on compensation rights instead of promotion rights, make it possible to develop a new dimension in the study of linguistic justice that we defined altogether as a minimum threshold of linguistic justice in, in societies. So in this paper, we, we keep two sets of rights, toleration rights and accommodation rights. But instead of using promotion rights, we introduce this context of compensations. So uh, we focus therefore on some domains only because these are domains in which the governments have exclusive competence and they are relevant for everyone living in a territory. First assumption to downsize a bit to focus, first thing. Second, we focus on these dimensions to see whether uh, languages are tolerated. So uh, whether there are measures aiming at interfering with individual private language choices or not. This is a dimension of linguistic justice we consider in the domain in general, in the domain considered in this paper and in society at large, whether publicly provided language related goods and only those in key areas of government competence and all in these areas are available and accessible to people with different linguistic repertoires, migrants, for example, speakers of minority languages, refugees, etc. And whether or not there, is, there are some form of compensation to compensate for the adoption costs that, re, that, are result, that, that, that result from the fundamental language policy. These are not promotion rights. These are compensation rights. Uh, compensation for uh, uh, an ori the, the original language choice of the government, providing goods and services in one or two languages and not in many others. So these compensation rights should be treated, should not be treated as promotion right proper, but as a redistributive measure to compensate the distributive effects of the original language policy of the state. And this is how we defined this kind of minimal approach to linguistic justice. As I said, we focus on the action of the government in areas where the action of governments is predominant or even exclusive. And we check whether the existing language policies allow for toleration, accommodate linguistic needs of people who are not proficient in the dominant language, and whether there is a form of compensation for uh, minorities, uh, uh, re and this compensation, as I said, is related to the regional language state, of the, uh, the regional language policy of the state. So these are the three dimensions, and, and those that presented in the previous slides are the domain in which we focus. And then, and then, you know, I'm coming to slowly to the conclusion. We have, however, to add a further dimension of feasibility to be pragmatic. Uh, and you know that is normal practice in different countries to allow for the provision of goods and minority languages only when number warrants. There are many cases of that. In, in Finland, in Canada, you know, and in other countries, you know, bilingual or trilingual public goods are provided only if number words. And, and that makes sense because uh, it responds to the fact that uh, providing public goods, oops, providing public goods in, in more than one language uh, have, has production costs. It can be high, can be low, this is not the point here. But these costs has to be uh, uh, has to be paid, and and therefore from uh, from a public policy point of view, it's easier to justify um, uh, bilingual or even trilingual uh, uh, publicly provided goods if uh, there is a large number of speakers of minority language rather than a small one. 
So we, ad we adapt for this purpose uh, an indicator that I'm not going to present into detail now. I can present this later in the, in the, in the appendix, uh, and so in the debate if we have time, so we don't go too much into focus, but we, we develop an indicator that is used as a weight. This is the key idea. So we, we, we have to wait to use, uh, to, to wait policies, to wait uh, to what extent um, uh, it makes sense from a cost benefit analysis to produce some goods. And in developing this weight, we have to take into account, of course, the total size of the population, the number of speakers of the minority language, and and uh, the, the relationship between the, the cost of production and the number of beneficiaries. This is called cost elasticity. To what extent costs of language policy are responsive to the number of speakers. Intuitively, if uh, a good like road signs, once it is produced, well, you know, the cost of producing uh, a system of road signs does not depend on the number of people who see these road signs, it's the same. Uh, whereas the cost of producing bilingual schools clearly depend on the number of people who attend these schools. So there are differences in the structure, in the cost structure of goods we provide. A website published in two languages has a certain fixed cost. And then it doesn't matter how many users visit this website, the cost is spread over a long, a big number of potential people. But running a hospital bilingually, well, this clearly depends on the number of patients. Okay, so this is basically what we do. We call this indicator of recognition and we use this as a weighting factor that enables to compare different linguistic situations, countries and, and public goods. And essentially critically, the value of this indicator depends on, on a critical threshold value called N star, which, you know, uh, according to a uh, uh, value of the size of the minority for which provision of some administrative or public services is estimated to be efficient, that makes, and it makes sense to, to provide them in a cost benefits analysis. I will come back to this later in the debate if we have time. So basically this weight is important because if, if the number of speakers is big enough, then it is justified to provide the, the service if it is not big enough, maybe it's not justified from a cost benefit analysis, but if now, nevertheless the community wants to provide this service, then we have to take into consideration loss in efficiency because too much uh, expenses are used, too much, too much resources are used to produce uh, a good, even if it's not a, a, a efficient, a cost benefit analysis to do that. But as I say, just keep this in the background as a weight that we use to take feasibility into account. And I'm going to finally go to the, the last part of the presentation. Please be giving me five minutes, Filippo, to conclude. So the list of indicators that are there for debate that we propose focus on policy outcomes rather than inputs. They are applicable for international or inter-regional comparisons. All their values are between zero and one, so that they can be, you know, we can make the sum of them and, uh, and value one is associated with an increasing level of linguistic equality and respect for individual preferences. So moving towards that is an improvement in, uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the quality of language policies. And all indicators refer to the provision of language related goods that can be directly affected by government language policy. So government, the indicators are responsive to language policy. And for the reason already explained, most of them, almost always, all, all of them, they, are, they involve the production of pure collective good that don't depend on the number of the people. Uh, uh, they are non-rival in consumption and non-spatial. So they are goods that are provided uh, they are easier to analyze. So they, there's, the structure of their cost is fixed. Uh, it's easier to study. And then I have two slides. Now you see here a big slide with a lot of information. We don't have to go into detail. There are two of these slides. As I said, uh, the, the, the core of this presentation is more about the approach to adopt it rather than the, the list of indicators. But here in this table, you see how we apply them. 
I will just you know call, recall them uh, uh, with you. So the first two indicators reflect the dimension of toleration. The first indicator just measure whether uh, in general in a country or region, there is absence of legislation or measures restricting the use of any language in the private life of residents in the jurisdiction of Germany. This is easy to, to, to collect data. You just have to check whether there are laws, regulation, or practices that forbid the use of languages in private life. Uh, and this is a public good because if the rights is guaranteed to everyone, then it's not rival, it's not spatial. And this value clearly has value zero or one is the contours. Uh, the second indicator is similar, but it concerns businesses. So whether there are restrictions in the use of languages in businesses, provided, however, that a translation in the dominant language at least is available. Okay, so you can use uh, whatever language you want, Chinese, Vietnamese, but you have to provide a translation. Then uh, indicator number three and four, they focus on dimensional accommodation. So whether language policy in a country accommodates the linguistic needs of people living in the country at the level of public administration. We focus here, for example, on the existence of the right of assistance in your own language due, during trials in criminal procedures. This is again something that is easy to collect data about that. So do you have the right to use your language in a court if you are involved in a criminal proceeding or not? If not, then the value goes, or the indicator goes to zero. If yes, it goes to one. And this has to be weighted by any language on a territory uh, with the weight, the indicator that we develop. As regards essential public services, we, we develop an indicator of proportional center for asylum seeker uh, that employ staff or linguistic mediators, translators, uh, cultural experts, and interpreters who are fluent in at least one non-official language that is relevant for asylum seeker. This is context dependent. It is partially rather than excludable, but it should be relatively easy to collect data to feed these indicators. Now, the rest of the indicators from number five to the following one refer to the compensation dimension, not promotion rights, rather compensation rights. And they monitor whether it is possible Yes, I'm almost finished. Whether it is possible to do some things in your own language, for example, to write uh, uh, a, a letter to authorities. This is indicator number five, uh, both for traditional minorities and new minorities. And the last indicators are more related to the public administration. We want to study the proportion of legally binding documents such as law and regulations that are available in different languages. Um, the proportion of forms and uh, of the tax office that uh, are published in the language used in the jurisdiction and, and, and the proportion of name of streets and place that are available in, in the different languages. Uh, the same thing applies to public, uh, essential public services, IG, public hospitals, clinics, etc. So here the compensation that Manso derives from the fact that the indicator takes a positive value, even if speakers of the major of the minority are able to speak the majority language. Providing goods in these minority languages is publicly goods in this minority language is a form of compensation in this approach for the distribution of resources resulting from the original language choice. And I conclude with these slides. Well, an index of linguistic justice is open to many criticism, of course. The most important one is that oversimplifies reality, methodologies flow, but these are the usual critiques that are uh, made to any indicators, even to the human development index. And these critiques are welcome, are very much welcome, because uh, they help us to uh, define better indicators and uh, they help us to move towards uh, an evaluation of linguistic justice, in a, in a, an applied evaluation of linguistic justice and policies dealing with that. Uh, the current debate in linguistic justice uh, literature is very stimulating, uh, focused mostly on theory, 
but uh, we have um, we, we have attempt in this paper to engage with uh, data analysis, measurements, and and policy and policy making, and uh, uh, and we hope that you know this 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 paper can contribute to the debate about the empirical evaluation of the distributive effects of language policies in complex multilingual societies, focusing, as I said, on the action of the government and focusing on some specific specific dimensions of compensation. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, sorry for you know, taking five minutes more than expected. And now uh, the floor is open for debate.